Hi everyone, welcome back to the last in a series of videos where we will dive a little bit deeper into the topic of cell division. This is Biotan, the host of this series. So let us do a broad recap of mitosis and meiosis. In mitosis, a single cell undergoes nuclear division and cell division to form two daughter cells, each consisting of a diploid number of chromosomes. In meiosis, a single cell undergoes two rounds of nuclear division and cell division, and we get, at the end of the day, four daughter cells, each consisting of a haploid number of chromosomes. You may be wondering what kind of cells undergo meiosis, right? Well, sex cells. Sex cells in our bodies undergo meiosis, and they give rise to gametes. Gametes, or maybe the more familiar terms that we've encountered, sperms, as well as eggs, these are gametes. Sperms and eggs, actually, they are haploid in nature. So we have sex cells that undergo meiosis to give rise to gametes. They are haploid in nature. You may be wondering why eggs and sperms need to be haploid, right? Okay, so let's consider this. Let's say we have a sperm here and then we have an egg here, right? And when the sperm and egg comes together and undergoes fertilization, we will get a zygote. The resulting zygote actually contains the chromosomes from the sperm as well as the egg. So if you think about it, if both sperm and egg comes with two sets of chromosomes, right, or maybe both sets of gametes, right, they come with a diploid number of chromosomes, the resulting zygote will end up with four sets of chromosomes. Now, if you think about it, if we perpetuate this, if this kid then goes on to form, uh, to create sperms of his own, or maybe a girl, eggs of her own, we find that the, if we go through many, many generations and perpetuate this, we'll end up with generations that end up with more and more and number of sets of chromosomes, and that's crazy. So, but what if we begin instead with one set of chromosomes? Right? If each sperm and egg is just haploid, we would then instead, after fertilization, end up with a diploid zygote. We restore the original diploid number of chromosomes. And then this diploid zygote would then go on to divide via mitosis over and over again to form all the other cells in the rest of the body. So uh, that's why we would need our sperms and eggs to be haploid in nature. So next, consider another question. Why do siblings look so different from each other if the sperms and eggs come from the same parent? Shouldn't, right, if the sperm comes from the same parent and the egg comes from the same parent, that we get siblings that look exactly the same? Well, we don't, right? Each sibling somehow turns, turns out different from the other. Well, that's because no two sperm nor egg from the same parent is actually genetically identical. They are not. So how can this be? How is it possible that every single sperm and every egg that's produced are not genetically identical, even though they undergo the same process of meiosis? I'd like you to think of it this way. When we play a game of poker, right, we use the same deck of cards, yet each player always receives a different combination of cards. Right? Every player always gets a different combination, even though we use the same deck of cards. So why? Well, that's because we always shuffle the cards, right? We always shuffle the deck of cards before we distribute it into every single player's hand. And this creates variation, variation with every single player. Every time we play, every time we play, we shuffle and every player gets always a different uh, combination of cards. We get variation. So in a similar way, each sex cell 
may come with the same chromosomes, but how we distribute the chromosomes, each with its own sets of alleles, results in a genetic variation among the daughter cells, the sperms and eggs. Right? So where, at which point of meiosis do we generate such genetic variation? Or in other words, at which point of meiosis do we do this little shuffle of alleles? Right? We change up the combinations a bit. So there are two key points where you'll find genetic variation being created. The first point is that actually at prophase 1 of meiosis. At prophase 1 of meiosis, we earlier on said that synapsis occurs. What is synapsis? Synapsis is the process when a uh, homologous chromosomes pair up with each other. Right? That's what synapsis is. What I did not mention before is that when homologous chromosomes pair up right, through the process of synapsis, they actually overlap with each other very often. Okay, so here is a pair of chromosomes, homologous chromosomes, but what I did not share is that they can actually overlap with each other. At every point of overlap, we refer to the point of overlap as a chiasma. Chiasma is singular for one overlap. But actually, the chromosomes can overlap multiple points. When it overlaps at multiple points, we refer it to it as chiasmata. And this overlap occurs between non-sister chromatids of homologous chromosomes. Right? I'm not sure if that makes sense to you. These two are sister chromatids. But these two are non-sister chromatids. Okay, so chiasmas form between non-sister chromatids, not between sister chromatids. And this is where the magic begins, right? If, when, where chiasmas form, actually, it can result in genetic variation because at the chiasma, this is what can occur. The regions that overlap, they can actually break and rejoin. Right? So you see over here, in this particular chromosome, you find that we have this particular LU present. This chromosome here, we have this variation of the same gene, so a different LU present. If I were to zoom in, okay, recap, huh? what's an LU? LUs are just different forms of the same gene. Largely, they are the same, but they may differ at some areas. Okay, so these are just two alleles present. But at the chiasma, where they overlap, they can break and then rejoin. So this is what you see. They break and rejoin. And then what you see is that the allele kind of crosses over. Right? They kind of swap sides. We call this process crossing over the alleles cross over. And so what you see now is that these homologous chromosomes, this homologous chromosome now, the sister chromatids are no longer genetically identical. Okay? They are no longer genetically identical. The second point of genetic variation is actually created at metaphase 1. Okay, so we look at metaphase 1. At metaphase 1, consider this. How each pair of homologous chromosomes pair themselves up along the metaphase plate will result in which chromosomes will end up at which poles, right? Uh, what do I mean by that? So you see, uh, this is how the homologous pairs pair up at metaphase 1. At telophase, you see that uh, you find these are the chromosomes that exist at metaphase at telophase one. Okay, I'm going to change the highlights a bit. Okay, all of the grey ones end up on the right side. The darker ones end up on the left side. But if you think about it, what's really? If you think about it, um, how the homologous chromosomes arrange themselves at the metaphase plate, it can change, right? Who's to say that the pairs need to arrange themselves this way. 
What do I mean by that? What if this pair of chromosomes instead arrange themselves this way? Okay. And as a result, if they do arrange themselves this way, you'll find that at telophase 1, now we find that each nucleus will end up with a different combination of homologous chromosomes. And what if we take this a little bit further, right? What if we look at this example here, this particular homologous pair pairs up this way, and then this homologous pair pairs up this way, we get yet another combination. Okay, we look at this particular cell here. Now each nuclei, each nucleus, comes with an even different combination of chromosomes. So just imagine how many combinations of chromosomes you can get with 23 pairs of chromosomes, right? How each chromosome arranges itself at the meta metaphase plate, how each pair of homologous chromosomes arrange themselves at the metaphase plate, is independent from each other. It doesn't affect each other how each one is going to arrange themselves. We refer to this process as independent, independent assortment of chromosomes. Okay, independent because at the end of the day, how each pair arranges itself is independent from another pair. Assortment because at the end of the day, after you independently pair up from e uh, each other, they will assort themselves um, into each nucleus differently. So together, synapsis resulting in chiasma or chiasmata forming and then resulting in crossing over coupled with independent assortment of chromosomes results in genetic variation in the daughter cells. This is our cell's way of shuffling the same deck of cards into different combinations. Or in other words, for our cells, we are kind of shuffling it to result in genetic variation in daughter cells, such that no two daughter cells will end up with the same combination of alleles. And that is why siblings from the same parents do not look the same, unless, of course, they are identical twins. So with that, we have come to the end of our video series, and I hope that you found these videos useful. Feel free to contact me if you have any further questions, and I'll be glad to have a discussion with you.